Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Thomas, and I am a public policy student and the outgoing ASUCR Senator for the UC Riverside School Policy. I am delighted to all to today's webinar with our special guest, Kim Carter of the Time for Change Foundation. But before I introduce our guest speaker, I would first like to spend a few moments going over the format for today's webinar. For the first part of today's online event, Ms. Carter will give a brief presentation. Then my fellow public policy classmates and I will be posing questions to her as part of a roundtable discussion. We will then devote the last portion of our event to a Q&A with the audience. Audience members, if you have any questions you would like to pose during the Q&A session, please do not send them via chat, but rather via the Q&A box below. Audience members can submit their questions anytime throughout the seminar via the Q&A chat feature. I will then pose audience questions to Ms. Carter directly once we reach the audience Q&A session. Now, to, now it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today's webinar. Kim Carter is the founder and ambassador of Time for Change Foundation. In 2002, she started the organization to create housing for homelessness, homeless women and their children. She has created evidence-based programs and services in addition to the full housing continuum, which includes two emergency shelters, 13 permanent supportive housing units, and developing her first affordable housing project, the Phoenix Square. The agency's budget has grown 500% since 2002, with current annual revenues exceeding $3 million. Ms. Carter is the author of Invisible Bars, Barriers to Women's Health and Well-Being During and After Incarceration, a scientific, quantitative, and qualitative health report, which provides a roadmap for addressing issues that lead to incarceration. She is the recipient of the James Irvine Leadership Award, the Rialto Mayor's 2018 Jewel Award, a Top 10 CNN Heroes Award, and an, and an NAACP Local Hero Award. In addition, in addition, she was named one of Ebony's Power's 100 Top Influential African Americans. We are so honored to have you here today, Ms. Carter. Thank you for having me. And I'm gonna thank the whole UCR team for putting this amazing event together and allow me to be a part of it. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and welcome everyone who's in the audience. Thanks for, I guess, selling out on this webinar and going to the YouTube. For those who are following, but let me go ahead and stick with the time. So let me share my screen and get right into the um, presentation. Hold on. Okay, so today we were talking about race, we were talking about poverty, and we were talking about some of those issues that we are being affected by in our community when it comes to the racial divide, most importantly, racism. So what I want to do is I want you to understand that none of this stuff exists with our economy, with our world, without understanding that everything is supported by by a system. And so we're gonna talk about system impacted and racial and economically driven. Because as we see time and time again, you know, that this world has been built on the backs of blacks and indigenous people. And we have a lot to um, repair in order to move forward. So in order to look at an economy, you gotta look at what builds on that economy. So the purpose of this presentation right here is for you guys to understand how this all ties into, you know, building this economic power in our community, how mass incarceration, the proliferation, you know, of the war on drugs and, and how we're living right now and what they call a, a pandemic. But see, the pandemic is just, you know, a widespread information about the epidemic and the epidemic of incarceration and the epidemic of poverty and other epidemics have been gone widespread for so long. 
And so the dictionary will tell you that the epidemic is something that's ra rapidly a spread of a disease. It means it's spread it really rapidly. And the pandemic is when it goes across city lines, county lines, and across the country. So you see right now with, um, with poverty, it's already worldwide. You see right now with incarceration, it's already worldwide. And now we see with this COVID-19, it's already worldwide. So what you have is a clashing of the titans. And then we look at what is being called civil unrest, we see that it's the racism, it's those pillars and those structures that have been supporting and they're dismantling too. And we know now when the economy is, is being threatened, we see what the system would do. It will come up with trillions and trillions of dollars of money to hand out to what we call the least of these to get this economy back to, back on again. But the same monies that wasn't able to be there to help with universal health care and to help to make sure that everybody has access to education. So we see right now when we're looking at disrupting the pillars of um, racism, you know, uh, white supremacy is, is all about them keeping that economy going. So let's look at that economy and let's look at this disease. So in 2005, I created what they call the disease of incarceration. What does that mean? That means that I was able to create the epidemiology, which is the pathology of this incarceration, which we was able to see for any disease to exist, it must have three things, an environment, an agent, and a host. I would like to also say shout out to UC Riverside because I see you guys was a part of our um, study way back then. So it's kind of like becoming full circle with this thing right here. But what it showed is that with this epidemic, and pandemic of incarceration, in order for it to exist, it must have these three things. So the environment, aging and host, we got to look at what's happening in those places. So let's look at this environment. Right now we have education systems that are failing. We used to be third or fourth in the world with education. Now we're like down at the bottom, like 43 or 45th. So we know that education has not been prioritized for all the people in um, this United States right here. We know that there's discrimination in access to higher education. And what does that mean? That means that we have a lot of programs at these institutions to retain people of color, to retain minority students, to retain um, women in these institutions. But why do you have to have these extra efforts? Because the system itself was designed with that same racial disparity lens. And so you see these institutions that have these disparities on and on. Let's look and see what's going on with housing. There's not enough affordable housing. There's tons of ordinances about building affordable housing. And when I say affordable, I mean affordable to those uh, essential workers, right? To the ones that we see we need when there's a pandemic involved. We needed our delivery men. We needed our, our ladies and our men that's working in Walmart. We needed these essential workers in these hospitals, cleaning up these hospital rooms. The ones that's making 10 and put out an hour. But yet these are the very ones who are on the outskirts of society and really can afford to have housing. We're talking about uh, systems that would prohibit you from having a group home based on who's living in there. And everybody knows right now that unemployment rate is just as high as, as ever, but it's already been high for people of color. You know, and then we look at this family structure that's been broken, fragmented, and no support. And I just want to say, when I talk about the family system, we have a system called the criminal justice system, which we know is unjust. And now that we can see the first person in that system was the police. And now everybody can see what the police do in our communities of being, you know, overprotected, over, over surveillance and underprotected. What we also see is that the, the husband or the wife of that system is the child welfare system. And just as much harm as the criminal justice system has done to our communities, know that the child welfare system has done that too. And these systems cannot sustain themselves without having bodies. And what bodies? These black and these brown bodies. So here goes this agent, right? Remember the disease had to have three things, an agent, the host and the environment. So here go this agent, the police, right? Then we got a legal system that disproportionately sentences people of color. So the darker you are, the longer your sentence is going to be. And then you go into these other places like these prisons, you know, and where did all these prisons come from? They just popped up all over the world in 1980s, 90s. The United States just started going tough 
on building prisons. And then when you come out of the prison, supposedly have paid for the debt to society, you will see that you are not really accepted back into society and you will continue to have what we call collateral consequences of discrimination. And then you have this government who got tough on crime. And so we gotta take a look at where has been our focus. Has it been on supporting families? Has it been on creating jobs? Has it been on housing opportunities? Well, you gotta look and see what happened with the money. So during the time when we were having, you know, communities were divested, schools was underperforming, was closing, libraries were shut down, Oh, America found money to build all these institutions, and these are billion dollar facilities, right? Way out in the middle of the boondocks, there's enough money to plant all this. And during this time, we only built one university, and that was the University of Merced. So where did that money come from to build those institutions? That was investment, and those investments need to return those dollars. In order for the prison to work, it must have bodies in it. So I want you to go back to the founding of this country. The founding of this country was the theft of indigenous land, right? And it was, it was based on the exploitation of the, our labor of enslaved Africans and indigenous people. That's the founding of this country. So that is what created the wealth and fuel with the uh, economic growth of the United States that we have today. And so we call that racial capitalism. And so when we look at these pillars of white supremacy, it's to support that type of capitalism, which is why they're crying about the economy right now to keep that going. So when you're anti-racist, you're anti this current system of capitalism as well. Did you guys see all that money was spent on all those, all those facilities? but yet still we can't uh, get the price for education to come down. Yet still we can't make sure there's housing in every community for people that need it, but we can go out and build these institutions and create these, this false dichotomy that these prisons make us safer. So when you come home from incarceration, basically people is looking for passion from the community, right? But there's one big old elephant that's in the room. And I want you guys to take a look at this right here. So what happens is we talk about the war on poverty, it's been a war on poverty for so long. I have never seen a war that they haven't thrown money at. So there's all there's this war going on on poverty, but they haven't found it on, on Baseline and D Street. They haven't found it in the inner cities of Chicago. You can't find poverty, but you have a war on it. Like when you had a war in Iraq and you had a war to go over there and look for those supposedly weapons of mass destruction, you put money into that. You was able to go find a man in a hole, what? 50 million miles away from where we're sitting at right now today, but you can't find poverty down the street. Okay, so that means the money is to be made in the pursuit of trying to find poverty, but it ain't being made in the actual getting rid of poverty. So we look at systems that support poverty. So what we need to do is stay away from these systems that trap people mentally. So like for our programs, we don't support women to get on welfare, we support them to get off of welfare. Why would you think that? Because mentally you get trapped because here you are a single mom, you working, you, you got food stamps, you're getting a subsidy for childcare, you on this job, you're thriving, you're trying to move up. Uh-oh, your boss decides to give you a $1.25 raise. You're so excited, but when you come back and you take that $1.25 raise and you look at your new paycheck and you turn that into your worker, all of a sudden, you're not qualified for that child care subsidy no more. So guess what? The child care that you needed to, in order to support your going to work has now been pulled out from under your feet. And so here you are in a, a job that you're hoping that you don't make more money so that you don't want to lose your child care because, of course, child care is like three or $400 per child per week. And that is not what your raise actually would cover. I'm talking about things like that's physically what gets you just emotionally and physically sick when it comes to like if you stand in subsidized housing. You could be standing in subsidized housing based on 30% of your income. You go, you get a $2 raise, then all of a sudden you get ready for your yearly evaluation. Then all of a sudden now your income is too much and now you don't qualify for that subsidized housing, even though there's no other affordable housing available. And then when we look at that wealth gap, we know the wealth gap that the top 10% of this nation is earning 90% of, making 90% of the money, right? So we know that it's getting wider and wider, that gap. And so one of the things that's uh, um, 
I'll say is the real problem is that particularly in the African American community and communities of color is that we don't have an economic base because we have been the product for this system for so long. We have been the thing they made money off of just our bodies. It don't matter if we in these elementary schools and we're not graduating. If we sit in that seat, that system get paid. It don't matter if we go to prison, if we get rehabilitated or not. If we sit in and lay in that bed, they get paid. So they have made money off of our bodies for so long. We have been the product in their economy. And that is why the system does not work for us. It was not designed for us. It was designed to use our physical body to make money. Not to mention the slave labor that goes on into the institutions, not to mention the corralling of all of our shopping and the economic base that our dollars create, the phone calls that cost exorbitant amount for long as it costs. We ain't gonna talk about that. Just by, by presence of our physical body in these systems, that's how they make money off of us. So when we try to make money into the uh, black community and try to build an economic base for ourselves, you know, we're always hit with the other part of the discrimination where the banks don't want to give loans and they want to do redlining. We want to try to get homes in better neighborhoods. So we have all this systemic racism system that's been going on for years. So we haven't been able to really pass down that economic wealth. Are you guys with me? Okay, so now I can only see a couple of people. I want to give some thumbs up for so I need some energy coming back at me. All right, all right, all right. So one of the things that I want y'all to also take a look at is that um, how, how it is that, like look for example, talk about this economic base, right? Now maybe two, one decade ago, you know, our Indians did not have the right to have casinos. And they were poor and they were living in trailers and they were, you know, uh, being oppressed by the system that stole their land, that took away their land, that today have some of their burial artifacts in these institutions. They're trying to get those artifacts repatriated back to them. And so here's this system of, you know, robbing land, stealing bodies, you know, or still upholding some of those same laws today and are taking ownership of other people's, other people's belongings. So now that these Indians have been able to create this uh, casino and get these gaming licenses, you will see now that they're creating an the economic base. So now they have something that they can grow and build that's only isolated toward them. Like you don't see everybody popping up casinos because it's something that is designed for the people who have their own sovereignty and their own land, but they're able to create and generate wealth for their community. And this is what we are missing in the uh, African American community. We're missing an economic base, right? And again, we, for so long, we have been just the thing to make money for other people. My physical body, I've made money for the parole officer. They had, they had, to, they had to parole, they had to supervise me on parole. It didn't matter I was homeless or not. They just need to know that I was out there. That created a job. Probation, that creates a job. Angle monitoring, that creates a job. So they've always been able to create a job off of this black body. And that's why these systems do not, do not work for us. And so we have to get away from these systems, create a system that works for us by dismantling that system, but simultaneously creating a system that works for us. And we can't allow people to keep profiting off of our pain. So what do we do at Tom Tate Foundation? We create our own ecosystem. That means we create within our communities what it is that we need. We, we build our own affordable housing, you know what I'm saying? We create opportunities for entrepreneurship. We teach on national education and money management, you know what I'm saying? We teach women how to have a home of their own. We teach women how to get their children back out of that child welfare system because that system will not give her the resources they would give that foster care mom. And so we look at these systems that support the separation of families and do not support keeping families together. So we, we wanna shift resources away from policing, put it back to the community. We want to be able to develop our own affordable housing. And that is what we do at Time for Change Foundation. This right here is just one of our facilities. It's called the Phoenix Square. It was built in 2012. Crime-free housing. It's been standing there looking brand new the whole time. It's beautiful. I mean, it is beautiful. And when people walk through there and have a tour, first thing they say is, oh my God, oh my God, I would live here. And when, I, when they say that, I'm thinking, well, why wouldn't you? What, what, what did you think? Did you think we built something for low-income women that would be under par? Did you think we would give them the least? See, we believe in giving those who need the most, giving them the best. 
we don't believe a little dab would do you. So when you walk in here, of course it looks like any place that would be $2,000 or $3,000 a month rent because why would I build anything else? Because we're low income don't mean we don't like nice things. And so here I am the author of Invisible Bars. This was actually when I did some scholarly work it's the uh, epidemiology of incarceration, and we use a social ecological modeling. I was able to partner with the public health department, and I was able to partner with, you know, of course, UCR and a lot of brilliant people. But basically, this is like Dr. Diane was used to say, we ain't crazy. So see, we ain't we ain't crazy. We know exactly what's going on. Then we have this positive futures one report that's on our website as well. And what we've had is some really good outcomes for women who have created their own business, doing entrepreneurship, creating assets, creating savings, and tapping into some of those resources that would help you build the wealth. Because right now, wealth building, we're like as African Americans, less than a dollar to compared to you know a white men's one dollar. We're like, we're, I mean, a hundred dollars. So I mean, we're like ninety nine times below when it comes to actually wealth building because we constantly are getting stripped of that wealth because the system is not designed for us to accumulate wealth. So I just wanted to share that and I stay within my time. And uh, thank you guys. Thank you, Ms. Carter, um, for your insightful presentation. Um, at this point, I'm now going to bring in my fellow classmates for the panel discussion. Um, so our first question comes from Maddie Bunting. Hi, Ms. Carter. I, I just saw a, a message in the chat pop up saying you're awesome and I just have to ditto that. Um, I love everything that you've had to say. And, and you talked earlier in the presentation about how the US has always, but especially recently, invested in prisons and invested in wars and not invested in reducing poverty or homelessness or issues that touch home to us. And by founding the Time for Change Foundation, I mean, you, you must have noticed a need to support those experiencing homelessness. And in, in recent months, you know, George Floyd's murder, as well as the Black Lives Matter protests have caused a, a discussion and a conversation about defunding the police and funding more community-based social services. So I'm curious, it sounds like you do, but I'd love for you to speak further about if it's beneficial, if, lo uh, if local governments collaborated with nonprofits like Time for Change and do work on that local community level in education, in affordable housing and everything you mentioned. Well, you know, it would be so wonderful if the system would, would police itself but it doesn't, it does not self-correct. It's only when we demand change does power concede. It does not concede because it's doing wrong. You have to understand the, the, uh, the tentacles of this white supremacy. You have to understand the, the depths to which it will go to maintain that status. So for example, the child welfare system harms children. I mean, harms children, yet they will come and take people's kids. You're the last person to be parenting somebody else's kids because your track record shows kids are very much harmed in your presence. Kids are harmed in your system. Kids are leaving foster care homeless that you have raised. So why do you feel the need to keep taking people's kids? Because you love to steal babies because that's going to feed that system, right? So when we say defund the police, it's like somehow the idea of policing society has been brainwashed into society that it makes us safe. But you know, black people and brown people know that those systems harm our community. So we don't look forward to them coming into our community and riding around. And I always say, if you feel so safe with them, let them sit on, 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 the, on the corner of your house. Go up in suburbia and park your, park your cars and your stuff there so you can feel even safer because we don't feel safe within my community because they cause harm. Right. And so look at, for example, the educational system. And I had a client who was on her way after 15 years of free from incarceration on her way to becoming an RN. She was she paid to go to school. She was almost finished. And within two months of graduation, she was terminated because she had a past felony conviction. But she had been disclosed that. So look how easy these education systems would kick somebody out after having occurred all that debt 
and like, like throw away trash. Thank God we advocated. Thank God we start pulling um, campaign finance, figure out who put that president in there, who's on that board. And when we start doing that, people start, oh, well, well who was she? Well, well why did you guys kick her out? Well, we'll let her back in then. But they wouldn't have did that if we didn't uh, show up and, and show out and using our voices. So when you say collaborate with the government, the government does not respect me. The government does not respect Kim Carter. You understand? They, they, they don't respect the fact that I am producing evidence-based programs with results, that I am getting evaluators from, from UCLA and, and from other institutions to prove that what I am doing is working, that we are eliminating homelessness, we are eliminating recidivism. They do not like that. So they don't wanna partner with somebody like me because I'm producing results and I'm giving up evidence and this evidence that what they're doing is not working. So, you know, it's hard to collaborate with a government who doesn't respect you, right? And me being a black woman, I think I'm allergic to oppression. I'm allergic to racism because I just break out in, shutting that down like i just i just can't take it you know and it comes in my spirit and it comes up in my throat and next thing you know I'm like mm. and i gotta say something i gotta use my voice and i just choose not to take this brilliance this brilliance and waste it at a table where i'm not respected as a as a full human being so what i'm saying is that we can create what we need ourselves we don't have to be reliant upon a system of oppression to unoppress us. Hopefully I helped. Yes, no, thank you so much. And I think it's uh, so important to use your voice and you're doing wonderful things with it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, next, we have a question from Daisy Gonzalez. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Ms. Carter, again, for being here with us and having these discussions that we definitely need to be talking about, I think, especially as university students. Um, my question to you is, can you speak to the importance of family reunification, as well as the importance of the legal and financial struggles of people visiting loved ones who are incarcerated both prior to and during COVID-19? Okay, so family unification is important. And I'm gonna tell you why. Because when a woman gives birth, there is a connection that is like none other. There is a physical, mental, and spiritual connection of bringing life into this world. And God gifted us with that ability. For the father, there is a connection of procreation. So there is a connection beyond what you could see, touch, or feel. It's just there. And so when we separate children from their family members, they are suffering neurologically. They are suffering from flight. They're suffering anxiety. They're suffering from PTSD. They're suffering from a sense of security. And we separating them from their mother, let's say for a mother, for example, for what? Don't tell me because she has an addiction, because the last time I checked, a drug addiction was a medical condition. And would you take, would you separate a child from their mother if they had epilepsy or if they had cancer? Or would you support that mother through her medical condition and support that family as well? But see, we have turned around and started demonizing and criminalizing women who have an addiction, which is a medical disorder in the DSM book. You see what I'm saying? So it's not even like, oh, I'm just saying it's medical. No, it's medical. It's in the medical, it's, it's addiction, substance use disorder. So why are we demonizing women, taking their children? And then we don't even have nothing to say, oh, because she got high, because she was on drugs, that it did something to her child. Like, like, like there's no tangible, okay, I went and tested her. She, she said, smoke marijuana, I'm taking her kids. Did you show that her smoking marijuana deprived her kid of safety, of health? Of, of, of food, of clothing, of shelter? No, it did not. You as a social worker just decided that it must be unsafe because you're taking this system of oppression and you're perpetuating it. But what are you doing? You're putting that kid into a system that is definitely going to harm. There are 10% of people out of foster care age out and they doing good. The other 90%, they coming to see me later on after prison or they out there homeless right now, you know, looking to pull away to to get back into mission society. So, you know, the system is not doing good with parenting, number one. Number two, visiting 
your loved ones in prison is very crucial because you need to make sure they stay connected to the outside because when you go in there, you're in a whole new world. Let's just say, for example, you know, you were with your friends and you were riding in a stolen car, right? If you knew it was stolen, so you're definitely guilty of stolen car and you guys had an accident and then somebody got hurt. Now you're in prison because somebody got hurt in that car in that accident, but yes, you were in the stolen car. So let's not forget that. So now that was that was your only crime. But now I'm going to put you in prison. I'm going to put you in a room with somebody whose crimes were a little bit more, you know, say a couple of murders, say, you know, some sodomy. So you're like, OK, uh, you know, I, I just I'm just in a, in a bad car. But now you have to learn how to live in an environment where there are people who have done some maybe some more violent type of crimes, which you have not been subjected to. So how do you survive in that environment? So you're getting traumatized being in that institution and the rehabilitation in there just suck. You know, they did change the name but it just sucks. So having outside connections is very, very important. But again, you know, they take the prisons and put them way out in the community, so in the boondocks. So you're from Northern California, you're probably being in prison in Southern California. If you live in Southern California, you're probably being in prison in Northern California. They make it extremely hard for your people to get to you, right? And then you're probably don't, you can't call collect home to me too often because the collect calls are enormous. I mean, just imagine like we might spend for us out here on a regular collect call, we might spend, you know, 40 cents a minute, 50 cents a minute. They like like three or four dollars a minute, you know. So it's like they get into that system and then the proliferation is exploitation of making money off of you is just exacerbated. Everything is times 10. They'll, they'll limit your choices to what you can use so you can't even shop around and, and get the best deals. So because it's all control to make as much extract. So extract as much profit off of this body as physically possible. If they if they could charge you for the air to breathe in there, they will be getting money off of that. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Yes, thank you, Ms. Carter. Um, I would like to take this moment in the middle of our student panel on discussion to remind the audience to please go ahead and type questions that, that you may have via the Q&A feature below. Um, I will pose your questions to Ms. Carter once we reach the Q&A um, portion of the presentation. Uh, now I will hand it off to my classmate, Genevieve Chacon, who will pose the next question. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, Ms. Carter, for bringing up such good points, especially how African Americans are disproportionately affected by systems that are in place in this country. Can you maybe go more in depth of how African American communities in California, and specifically the Inland Empire, are affected by the prison cycle? So prior to uh, COVID, you know, we were second the Illinois Empire was second in the number of people is sent to prison right behind Los Angeles, right? So when you look at the impact of incarceration, it's not just black people. Like we may be, you know, the highest, but know that my brown sisters is running a close second. So we can't even really have this conversation without talking about black and brown, because the bottom line is we are all in this together, right? Even as we work with um, different community organizers that's working on different issues, making sure that the government spends money in your community, making sure that people can get into higher education, you know, making sure that people can access housing and, and make sure kids can go from high school, and be prepared to actually go to university. Everybody's working on the different silo issues, but it's all a culmination of us trying to create a whole society where everybody has a chance to thrive. Every child should be able to dream at night and be able to go to a higher education. And even when you guys go into these institutions, I'm going to tell you, I don't have a PhD, but I got a PhD. These places are, taught, are, are there to teach you to teach you how to think, not what to think, not what to think. Because you got to remember those systems of oppression printed those books. That, that, that's, that's why so many times we're not even in the history books. It's like, hello, I know my ancestors was there, you know, hello, I know it was there. I know we the first, we the first folks here on this planet. I can look over in Egypt and tell you that we ain't crazy. We must have was smart. We built some people. Pyramids, didn't we? You still don't even know how we did that. Am I right? Am I wrong? So why would you want to erase us from history so blatantly? It's because of the greatness. It's because of the power. And one of the things that I um 
I love what I've watched on YouTube was this sister said, you know what I'm saying? As black people, we are we are so forgiving, but at the same time, do not get it, do not get it confused with being complacent. Do not get it confused with being um subservient. Subservient. I, I am radical. I radically think about how to reimagine a world where I don't got to have somebody's knee on my neck. I radically think about that I can be free in this world and do whatever it is I dream to do. That's why I'm an entrepreneur. That's why I start focusing because I like to create and I don't want to be suppressed, oppressed, or de stressed by a system who would not even see me as a whole human being. So when I walk in this world, I walk in this world knowing who I am and being happy I am in the skin that I am in because it because I am resilient. Because I do come from a folks that came through the middle passages and survived. Because I do come from a folks that you try to figure out how to keep living, how to keep breathing despite our kids being sold out. How to keep living and how to keep breathing is despite our men being hugged. I come from a strong lineage of women and smart women. And I know a lot of PhDs and PhDs and, and MDs and doctors and all that. And I know that there is greatness. I have some really great friends that are white, that are white and they get it and they get it. They're not sitting there in the, in the blind like, oh, well, you know, what is that all about? They understand these systems of patriarchy. They understand the systems of oppression. They understand white supremacy because at the end of the day, they see how it benefits some or not others. There is not an equal access system that's going on here. So yeah, we need to be able to access our own capital, create our own economic base. Why not? Why not? Martin Luther King said this, and he said this in one of his films. He said that he watched now, remember, he was up there talking to presidents and all that, but he watched as the African-Americans in the South were starting to try to farm their own land. And they needed some capital to help get the proper equipment and get the irrigation going on that. And he watched how our government brought in white folks from Europe, peasants from Europe over here to this to this country and gave them subsidy and gave them money to learn how to farm, to learn how to do the very thing that we was that we was already doing, that we had already been doing for free. But rather than support our growth and our mission, you sought to make sure that we would never get a leg up. And every time we think about trying to stand up, we try to pull the book up from one of our foot. So no, we can't depend on your system. And no, we can't get in there and get happy and get comfortable because you ain't never gonna be right because you don't like the idea that we ain't crazy and we could think. So I would say that. That is how the Inland Empire is holding on to that last little bit of racism. The Inland Empire has been so oppressive to Kim Carter. So, I mean, so, uh, I'm talking about if, if, if there's a piece of dirt, land is sitting there, it's been dirt for 25 years, and I want to build affordable housing on it, I have rich millionaire white men come out of their beds, come to the city council meeting to speak up against me building 40 units of housing for women and children on a piece of dirt that's still sitting here dirt today. When I say millionaires, mean that they, they, they could buy the land. And I'm, I'm like, if, if you wanted it, you would have it already. It's just sitting there empty, but you rather nothing, nothing be there than to see me building that land. That's how oppressive that these systems are. That's how much racism is running around in the, in the empire right now. Is that you would rather uh, create a law that says you can't house more than two people in the house that's on parole and probation at the same time. So now you're trying to create a law against what I do. So I'm housing people coming from prison and homeless women too. I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, well, sister, you know, you're on probation and the other sister I'm already housing, she's on parole. So I can't bring you in because the San Bernardino city has made a law that makes it illegal. You know what I'm saying? Of course you're going to make the greatness that I'm doing illegal because that's what you do. That's what you do. You want to illegalize the very thing that, I mean, you want to legalize, Ill, make illegal the very thing that I'm sitting here getting awards for. Hello? So I'm like, well, how am I being humanitarian on one day and the next day I'm a criminal? But guess what? I'm going to always be a criminal in your eyes because I ain't going to never let go of the fact that I'm going to make every opportunity I can for another sister to succeed, for another family to get their kids back, for another family to thrive because we ain't crazy and we can thrive. But it takes all of us, all the support, people like yourself, you young students, you're it. Our new executive director, Vincent Perez, She's just a little older than you. You, you, you are. You guys are our future. My job is just to keep you, keep you moving. Don't let you get comfortable. It ain't about the house and the car. You gonna get that. You supposed to have that. It's about changing this world. 
It's about making a place for everybody's kids to thrive. See, it don't matter right now if Black people have the pandemic a COVID-19 more than everybody else. Because guess what? You too can catch it, right? So that means we got to make sure that everybody can get healthy. You can't just let people on the side let them be suffering the most because we're all in this together. Thank you so much, Kim Carter. <laughs> Especially during this pandemic, it is Black and Brown communities who are affected more during this pandemic. So thank you for also bringing that up too. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, next up is one of our Master of Public Policy students, Laura Salas. Hi, Ms. Carter. Uh, you mentioned uh, previously about regarding um, homelessness. So my question to you is, what is the state of California doing well in supporting those who are homeless in comparison to other states and where can it improve? I think right now what the state of California is doing well is acknowledging that homeless people matter too, right? I would say that prior to the COVID, it was like, mm, they homeless. Mm, here's a tent over there. Mm, they're under the bridge. But I think this COVID pandemic, right? And, if, and the realization that this whole economy gonna shut down. I'm gonna tell you about that. When, when, when they heard the economy gonna shut down, folks, turned, folks changed they too. All of a sudden now they like the homeless. No, seriously, you know, this pandemic and this and everything shutting down, these people, they, these people woke up. This system, it's like, oh, we need stimulus money. We need trillions of dollars of stimulus money. Give everybody a check. Give all the poor people, give them an extra money on their unemployment, give them something. Because the bottom line is they scared to death by, by the economy shutting down. So I would say that the California right now is acknowledging the homelessness. I, I, I will say that. They have the California where it can improve that is do not be so reliant upon the system. So like, for example, the, the governor's office puts out money for building affordable housing and, and for helping with the homeless. And for the, they, they give the money to the county. Well, you know, the, my county, San Bernardino County, come on. So when you're giving the money to these other systems, then, you know, you're putting up roadblocks to actually getting the help that's needed on the ground. You know, I once had a conversation with um, the director of how the director of community and housing for San Bernardino County. I was like, I was like, don't you don't find it kind of strange that me and you both could be in our cars and pull over to a homeless person, and you here you are managing all the programs with, with all these millions of dollars, and you can't get that person housed. But here I am, this managing time for change foundation. I can get that person house that don't worry you for you to have, for you to be over all those programs because you know they don't be working <laughs> that's why you can't pull over and help nobody because you know it's so layered with so much bureaucracy that you can't even make it work but then you expect people to partner with you and make your stuff work that you know don't work so it's like that is what i think california needs to do is put their hands into money get the get the money out the hands of the sheriff Bottom line, we don't need the sheriff department working with the homeless. Like, hello, you can't even house people in your jail right now. So why would you want to be working with homeless people? You can't house them neither. So why are you even in the housing program? You're just an overpaid, overrated, right, social worker or a street outreach person. And the real scam is that we're paying you exuberant dollars to do what we can pay somebody $20 an hour to do which is to go out and communicate and engage with homeless people. And what about all the formerly homeless people that we've had that have been trained up to be leaders like Sarita Reed and, you know, Tawana, all of these people who have been trained up to be leaders, they can be leading a whole team of people to go out and work with the homeless and get them prepared to, they pay what they prepare to get into housing. So quit being so reliant on your lower system because everybody knows the system has failed. The system has failed, but we have found a way in our ecosystem to work and to get outcomes. Thank you so much for your, um, your great points. Thanks. All right, so we have um, our last question from our last panelist, um, Maya Prasad. Thank you so much for be taking the time to be here, Ms. Carter. We really appreciate your dedication and enthusiasm on these important issues. My question is, how do you view the future of nonprofits in the 
Inland Empire and in terms of coalition building and partnerships? Well, I think, um, I think now is a great time for the coalition building. I think now is a great time for partnerships because um, pretty much black and brown led organizations are empowered to recognize that they can lead, number one, and number two, that it doesn't matter if you're at a table if you're not eating. So if you need to go prepare your own table so that God could do what he said, he's gonna prepare a feast for you in the face of your enemies, then go ahead and set your own table. But it doesn't make sense to set a table where you're not being fair, you're not being respected, and you're not making a difference. So I think now is the time for people to really understand that it's okay to say, no, I'm not gonna play your sandbox because you've been playing unfair for so long. And the thing about it is, we know that it's been unfair, but we still been sitting there because we didn't think we had all the choices. But today, we know we got choices. Today we know we got choices. And the thing about it is for those other systems that know that they're that they not working and them coalitions, especially them coalitions that's ran by government employees. When government employees be running coalitions, you know, pretty much it's, it's about just having meetings, 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 meetings. Because for real, the government employee can't even really make no, make a decision because everything got to go back up. Got to go back up to the bosses, boss, 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 boss. So for real, you ain't ready to just move on nothing. So anything that's community-based led, and driven and government can support those efforts, the better our community is going to be. Thank you. I would like, like to say to all the participants out there that um, if you go to Time for Change Foundation's website, it's www.timeforchangefoundation.org. You can go on there and you can look at our playlist and go on there and look at number 13 or 14. I want you to see the CNN Heroes Award video. Why? Because that award, I was, I'm gonna tell you something. That award, I was standing next to a 16 year old girl who went backpacking across Europe and wound up in Nepal, started an orphanage and had like 55 children in her orphanage. I was standing next to a man who figured out how to get water up from these mountains down to the village so that these women can be able to spend more time with their children and, and wash and cooking and cleaning as opposed to trekking up this mountain to carry back three or four buckets. I was standing next to a street doctor who goes underground on the street to make sure that people can get their diabetes medications and make sure they're able to get their chronic health conditions contained. So when I'm standing next to these people who I see are doing amazing, amazing, amazing work, I'm like, wow, you know, God has really positioned me in in a, in, in a way where I could see the work that we do at Time for Change Foundation, that we're doing amazing, amazing, amazing work. So when I say that, it's not to brag or boast, but it's to say out of 50,000 nominations across 80 countries, we made it to the top 10. We made it to the top 10 of the world, of the, of the world. So when I say here's a program, the, uh, uh, agency that, that, that was black led and still uh, people of color led that has um, struggled for investment that has constantly kept trying to prove ourselves, prove ourselves. I always keep trying to say, let me get the research let me get the evidence. They need evidence, evidence, evidence. I didn't gave you so much evidence that this worked. I don't got to do evidence no more. I didn't gave you so much fact upon fact upon fact. I don't gotta get any more facts. The bottom line is there's just people who don't want to see good happen and they're not gonna come on board. But for those of you who do, for those of you who want to make a difference, support Time for Change Foundation. We got amazing young leadership right now, Vanessa Perez, and she is there. She is holding it down. And I'm telling you, at 30 years old, she needs all your kudos. She needs you to go on our Facebook and, and like us and, and go on our Twitter and say something. And if you're listening to this thing right now, my handle is uh, Kim Carter 4408 on a on Instagram. Yeah, go on Instagram, give me a shout out or something and let me know that something I said today moved you. Right now you should be on fire. You should be inspired. You should be ready to go. You should be ready to push an envelope, cross a line, do a boundary. Don't stay status quo. Don't get comfortable. There's nothing how to get comfortable. Be as uncomfortable as possible because that is where the change is going to happen. That's where the synergy is going to happen. And we're going to make a difference going to be able to be seen 10 and 15 years from now. So I'm saying, hey, Let's do this. Thank you, Ms. Carter, um, for answering questions from our public policy student panel. At this time, I will now open it up for questions from our audience. I'm gonna go ahead and look at the Q&A box. Um, if needed, we will have um, an extension 
for time so we can get your questions answered. All right, so um, our first questions come from Ernie Powell. Um, they ask, where are the strategies for change? What um, and are there inherent rights in the American system that can lead to change? So one of the things that we can always count on is we can be able to quote the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of justice, right? Y'all remember that one, right? So inherent in an inalienable right is that one. That's an inalienable right. So as sure as you're breathing, Mr. Powell, as sure as you're standing on all 10 of your toes and you walk in, you have the right to do just that. You have the right to think, the right to create, to write to be all that, that you can be right here in this America because this is why they say this is the greatest place on earth because you're supposed to be able to do all that, that you want. So my point is the change begins with you on the inside and you walking in that. You got purpose because you was born. You got passion because you want to see something happen. Move into that. And whatever I can do to help motivate you and get you on your way, let's do this. All right, so uh, our, oop, am I, okay. I just wanted to make can sure. Somebody I type my, can somebody type my website in there for me? Type my website in the, in the chat for them. Will do, we will do. Okay, so Vincent Rosso asks, Ms. Carter, can you elaborate on the role of community and cross-community solidarity to the importance and mobilization of marginalized people fighting against injustice also? How do you ensure your own mental wellness while navigating your leadership positions? So one of the things that I want to say that is so important, thanks for asking that question, is that particularly with, you know, with my black and my brown uh, brothers and sisters, right, you know, so it's like right now there are children in cages at the border. Do you guys know that? That there are children in cages at the border, right? So, so, so knowing that it, 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 it just irritates the heck out of me. So why, we, my point is so, so at this point, we could co-collaborate and move on that, right? So when we talked about mass incarceration, note that, note that that was detention on the way. So now they call detention centers and brown people are up in there. But my point is, as long as this world continues to be an incarcerated world, there's over 10 million people currently incarcerated. You know what I'm saying? Black and brown, we have to work together on these issues. We have so much alike. So I think it's so important for us to cross collaborate and for us to, you know, let's put our issues out there. Put our issues out there on the board, pick the top three and let's put our issues on there that will separate us, right? Let's identify what would make you not come to the meeting. What would make you not move forward? Because what happens is if, if you're not working in an area you're passionate with, then it becomes a job. And nobody needs an extra job without pay. So let's go ahead and work on all the areas that we're really passionate about because then it becomes fuel. And it's, it's fuel for passionate change. And then let's go ahead and move forward on that. We have so much alike. We have so much more in common than people think. And so I think it's important that we work across coalition. I think it's important that we understand systems. And like just for myself, for example, I have a very strong presence. And so my my leadership is sometimes just being in the room. It's like I have I have this presence. I don't know why. That's why I'm a good motivational speaker and I can move the back of the room because I have a presence. I can just sit it back there and get them on their feet, right? So my leadership tells me that I need to make sure people who are in my presence feel empowered to step up, that I need to pull them in. I need to get them to start talking because my presence will have them, well, she got it, or we'll have them like go sit back. But I need, so my leadership is to pull them up. So I'm a great person to pull people up and put them in and put them in the front. Like, come on, you got this. I believe in developing leaders. So I believe that, you know, like my role, my motivation gift is to motivate somebody to do something great. So that's the role that I play with my, with my leadership. Hey, Laura. <laughs> Oh, I was muted. All right, let's get the show on the road. So Michael Paul Wong asks, in the state of California, increasingly community colleges are getting into the business of providing housing for their students in order to support students who are homeless. Recently, disadvantaged, 
dis discharged veterans and, and lower income. What have you learned about building high quality housing for people with lower incomes that the community colleges could benefit? I've learned how to build them. I've learned how to build them at a very effective cost rate. That's what I've learned how to do. They could benefit from they could benefit from that. So tell them to look me up. Now here's another website for you. Cause I have started a company called CHAMP, the Center for Housing Advancement and Motivational Projects. And that website is K I M S is in Sam CHAMP, C H A M P dot com. Go on there and you'll see all the services I can provide to help people to turn into developing their own affordable housing and how to navigate that system. And this is why I tell you that, you know, we're so brilliant, right? Because nobody would have ever knew that, oh, because can Kim Carter uh, develop affordable housing? Well, she didn't go to school to that, but see, I can do whatever I put my mind to doing. That's what you need to know. You need to know that I, if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to get it done because I got the ability to figure it out. That's what I know how to do. And so please tell your university to contact me. And then it goes to back to showing you, look, even a university recognized that if I don't help students get housing, what they can afford and sustain them, they won't be able to compete, complete this university, right? And so you get people that's into other social type of work now because of the drastic conditions in the community where something as basic as housing is just not available and everybody needs housing. You know, when this land was here before the first boat ride arrived, people were living in TPs. Now you see people right now living in tents. But it's not by choice because because the community, the, the government is saying, well, I want to build a bridge over here. Well, do I need a new bridge when my people living under the bridge? They ain't driving over the bridge. So I'm like, no to the bridge, <laughs> right? Yes to housing. So they'll come in and build what they want to build when they want to build it. They're not building for our community. But see, we are supposed to be the government. So the more that I get you elected and get you in the office, the more we can turn the tide. We need to make sure we're voting. Vote, 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 vote. You've got to vote. Make sure you vote. Your vote counts because we have got to turn the tide. And I mean vote for your student body at your school. Start off there. Then vote for your city council. Then vote for your county board of supervisors. And then vote for your state. And then vote for your federal people. But my point is your vote counts. And it's more y'all than us. I'm baby boomer. I'm baby boomer. Y'all got this. Y'all got this. All right, thank you for your answer. Um, Nikki Detman asks or says, great information. Um, can Ms. Carter speak about the school to prison pipeline and how the community advocate advocates to break the system? Hello, hey, Ms. Nikki. So, you know, the school to prison pipeline is just this at third grade, right? Those third grade test scores. So the prison industrial complex, which is what it is, has decided to tap into the school system and find out how many third grades you got that's filling on this standard test for reading. And the based on that number is how they, they decide how fast and when to build these prisons using those third grade test scores. So my thing is, why is a school system to able to be um, uh, operating when it's not even able to educate kids in the first and second grade to be able to read by the third? So, so, so the question goes back to when can we have schools accountable to delivering on the education that they promised? And you can't blame the student because the student came to learn. That means you need to reshuffle your delivery process. You need to be able to engage students with different learning styles. You just can't keep down there being no lecturer of ain't nobody learning. So how do we hold those schools accountable to actually delivering what they promised on? Because do you think it's fair if we have schools and we have school superintendents and these school superintendents is getting, you know, 50 and 60 thousand dollar raises and stuff, but they're not graduating for 10% of the, of the kids. It, that, 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 does that seem right to y'all? Of course not, right? Because if you was a for-profit company, that board, is, that board would have fired you for not delivering on, the, on that product. And why don't we see the importance with our kids? Now, I will tell you, we had a wonderful superintendent, Dr. Dells Marston, that when he was in San Bernardino superintendent of schools, 
He was able to turn some stuff around. He was able to close the achievement gap. He was able to do a lot of good stuff. And so, you know, how do we keep making sure that we're on that stem to moving, moving kids up and closing the gap? And a part of that, which is why me and him partnered so well, was the fact that by me providing stable housing for my women and children, those children could go to the same school consistently and then the education was disrupted and then they too were able to learn because our children are brilliant they just need opportunity so i think that school to prison pipeline starts off with the schools recognizing what's happening in kindergarten and first grade like you know as a kindergarten teacher when these kids come to school who came to school ready for kindergarten and who came to school hair not calm uh clothes not prepared for like the first day of school you got to have a new outfit everybody know that right first day of school you got to have a new outfit when you're in kindergarten you got to be cute that's just how it goes now every kindergarten teacher can look and tell what kid hasn't had that proper support right so at that point that that should be a sign to how do we support this family to be able to support this kid to be able to have this kid prepared for, for school because a lot of it comes back to them support people are dealing with you know stress they're dealing with mental health they're dealing with poverty they're dealing with lack of access they, they're dealing with low opportunity so we got to come together as a family that's why i want to defund child welfare and fund family support thank you nikki All right, thank you. Um, our next question comes from another attendee. How can we personally take further steps to dismantle these institutions of systematic racism? Say it again. Um, how can we personally take further steps to dismantle these institutions of systematic racism? So the first thing that you can do, and this is my belief personally, is that when you at that table, speak up. Don't sit there with, don't sit there at that table no more and let them push this stuff to the side. Don't act like George Floyd's death was in vain. Don't act like racism doesn't exist. Don't act act like these systems aren't oppressive, speak up. You know what I'm saying? Start having those conversations. Like let, let's look at some things that we can do immediately to alleviate some of this oppression that we've been dishing out as a system for so long. And then let's, let's look at some structural things that need to change because here's the thing, there is not one system. Let me hear you say one system. There is not one system that is not layered and intertwined with racism. There is not one system that does not have it. So that means all systems have it and all systems are oppressive because they, they support one another. And those are the pillars of white supremacy those are the pillars of the racism and the ra racial gaps that we have. And that's why you see it happening across system. Healthcare system, who at the bottom? Black and brown. Okay, education system, oh, who at the bottom? Black and brown. Okay, criminal justice system, who's up in there? Oh, black and brown. Okay, hold on, hold on. Child welfare system, who's there? Oh, black and brown. It's not by accident. It's not by, you know, oh, we're, we're not that lucky. We, we would be hitting the lottery if we was that lucky. We're not that lucky to hit the bottom numbers and everything. So it, it got to tell you that these systems are promoting and exacerbating that type of oppression, that type of racism, that type of disparity. And so, and please, for God's sake, do not go do another research project. If I hear another person want to do millions of dollars of research, the last book is still good. The last research project that was done that showed the disparity, that data is still good. Until we address that, there's no need to keep throwing more and more money. Yeah. Well, let me see how far. Well, how long? Well, how long was the far? Well, how far was the long? How long can it go? Like, give me a break. Put those resources into disrupting the patterns. But and here's the thing: don't be afraid of black and brown people at the table. Don't be afraid of working on the table. Don't be afraid of people who are formerly incarcerated to come and be a part of your dismantling the criminal justice system. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of us and don't think you know it all. Don't think because you know, well, I, I went to Harvard, you know, I went to some of the best schools and da da da. And, and it did not prepare you for this. The only thing changing this world right now is street soldiers. If people on the front line, on the ground, it's moving this social change. It is not because somebody did a research project and discovered that things are really bad over there. You've been knew that. You been knew that. You still haven't poured money over there. You been knew it was a fire. You still haven't put water over there. That is how you sustain uh, the disparity. That's how you keep this thing thing going on and on because you want to keep researching. 
Now it's time to do something about it. Do something about it. So right now is the time for you to push back on those systems and you feel it in your spirit. If you're a black and brown person out there right now listening to me, you know what I'm talking about because you feel it in your spirit. You feel it in your stomach when you're at that job and you're working it every day. And you know the students you're trying to work with aren't getting their posts to get. Now is the time to say something. Uh, my brother, John Lewis, who recently passed away, he said, I want to be in that good trouble. I want to be in that good trouble. You know what I'm saying? If you see something, say something. You know, if you could do something, do something. So I'm calling all you guys, get in that good trouble. I always been in trouble. I, I've been in trouble since the day one, since I opened up my first shelter, I was in trouble. I didn't even know I was in trouble. So they, they, they start coming for me, but what I knew is that I had the right to open up my home to six women unrelated. And I wasn't going to let nobody deny me of that right. I didn't even know how deep this racism thing was because I wasn't really socially conscious. I, was, I, I wasn't even really woke. Today, I'm so woke that I will never sleep on you again. I, I will never sleep on the system again. I am so woke. <laughs> Yes, uh, it seems like one of our panelists has one more questions and then we'll get back to um, our attendees, uh, but Laura? Hi, Ms. Carter. Uh, thank you, Emily. My question is, um, what motivated you to, to establish the, um, your organization, Time for Change? I want to say that it was spiritual led. I was working at the National Orange Show. I had my job, I had my office, I had my car, my little relationship. I was doing good, had a little house, I just didn't have a dog. And so I was minding my own business and I was doing 12, I'm, I'm in recovery, I have 26 years clean and sober. And so I was doing 12 step meetings and I was being a speaker and I was being of service and I was, you know, I was being a leader, helping women to get in recovery. And God was like, you know, I didn't bring you all this far for you to get comfortable in this little old office. I was like, oh, you talking to me? He was like, I ain't bringing you this far to get comfortable. I need you to help women who is just like you. So I thought maybe I need to take on more sponsees to help more women in recovery. But it wasn't that. I was being called to help women who wanted to change but needed a place to change at. So all the time I got out of prison, I would come home. I really didn't have a home to come to, but I wouldn't tell nobody. So I would basically just get out. And I would be homeless and I would wind up back in again. Then I would get out and I would be homeless. I would go back in again. I, I ain't know nothing about no shelters. And if I did, I wouldn't have went to one because I would have had an idea what a shelter looked like. And they'd be like, nah, I'm cool, right? I stay out here on the streets. And so when I started Time for Change Foundation, I wanted to still keep my job and, and open up this home. And but the women, they, they they were needy. You know, I needed to give them all my attention. So the Lord was like, leave your job. I'm not like, no, you ain't say leave my job because you know I got a really good check coming right now. I probably was at like forty five thousand dollars a year, but coming from prison and and getting that check, it was like a good check. I could afford my rent. I could afford my car note. I had my daughter back. So you know, you ain't say leave my job. And the one thing that I had held on to was that health insurance. And right before um, I gave my resignation to the job, the company came and said, you know, we're gonna stop giving health insurance to level one and two employees. And I was like, well, no, because I work in the accounting department and we got enough money that if everybody gave a copay, we could all have insurance. And the power to be was like, no, that's not what we want to do. We want to just cut y'all insurance off and keep ours. So I was like, oh. You know, again, not having no voice to make any changes. And so God was telling me to leave my job. So my sobriety birthday is March 15th. April 1st is the first day of no health insurance. So I was like, okay, Lord, my sobriety birthday, I'm putting in my resignation. April 1st, I'm done with this job. I stepped out on faith. And from that day to stay right here, I haven't went without nothing. That's how you know God is a provider. He supplies all of our needs. Because I haven't went without nothing. And everything that I have tried to do has been... Um, bless. Every time I have ran into some optical, I've been able to get over it. If I have to fight it, scratch it, kick it, step on it, stop on it, or burn it up, but I'm moving. I have not been, uh, I have not been comfortable with oppression. I fight through that, and I've constantly been seeking more knowledge. I have to go learn. What it is that I don't know, I go learn. I don't depend on a system to educate me about nothing, because you're going to miseducate me. I go get what I need to know for myself, and so, you know, I 
I found out I love to read. I found out that I never had a problem with rules and regulations. I just need to know what they are. I don't like the game play it, but the game changing on me in the middle of the game. I'm not I'm not good for you starting off with me one way and then later on come to me and say, well, no, because what we really meant was ah, mm -mm, don't change the rules on me because how we start is how we're going to end. And so those are the things that I did when I first got started in Conflict Foundation. And from then we've done, like I said, we've done evidence-based programs. We have multi-billion dollar programs. We have um, a program called Positive Futures 2, which is basically an evidence-based approach a crime prevention program and basically what it does is help women coming from prison so we did a model 220 220 women from prison who had um mental health dual diagnosis substance abuse disorder coming back to five cities in san bernardino county and we eliminated recidivism for three years and they hired ucla as the evaluator for that project and so that at that moment right there show people for this investment right here we can eliminate recidivism we can get women their children back we can help them get back into society become taxpayer citizens so i thought i was going to be flooded with all kind of money oh yeah i got my evidence you know dr so-and-so even proved that it's working and all that <laughs> no they were not trying to fund that evidence they rather fund the system than fund something that would dismantle the system but fortunately we was able to um two years later we was able to get another five-year commitment so we got like a 2.2 million dollar grant to work that same program and we're doing it in san bernardino county right now again thanks to phyllis scott who's doing amazing she's our director of operations formerly incarcerated herself and she's leading that program and i'm telling you we're one of 15 in the whole United States. And when we go to those meetings, they're looking at us like, you know, how do you guys get these formerly incarcerated women to come back to you? How do you get them to talk to you? And we're like, because we're formerly incarcerated. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you know, because we are our community. We are the people that I help. And that's why they feel so much love. And they feel so much connection to Time to Take My Nation because we actually are the people. Thank you so much for your um, um, input. All right. Somebody, somebody asked about somebody. I'm sorry. Somebody asked about um, the going back to school in the uh, chat box and about the kids. And so, you know, I do want to say that at the Time to Take Foundation Shelter, we have been, you know, struggling with how to best support our children in our education center, our learning centers that we have in our shelters because of the school because. When you live in shared housing, the way we have our housing program in San Bernardino City, you know, that it's like if one person comes back with the COVID, the whole house is going to get the COVID. And then that means that our staff will have to engage or interact with somebody with the COVID, which puts everybody at risk. And we don't want to do that. So we've been looking at, you know, safety plans. So what's the safety plan if one of our families get the COVID? Well, we know we can do a 14-day quarantine in the hotel. We have resources for that. And we're getting ready to open up another home just so that we could have another place for women and children who are escaping the COVID have already done 14 days and want to be able to re-enter back into a home style setting. You know, we're also thinking about the thousands of people who are going to be up for eviction because of this um, rent moratorium that has recently been expired. And even if it does get extended a little bit longer, it's just kicking the ball down the road. You know, the, at the end of the day, if you needed money to pay your rent now, you're going to need twice as much later on. And so there's going to be a huge... Uh, slew of evictions and people will be entering the homeless um, situations and we want to be able to help those families to get rapidly rehoused. We want to be able to build affordable housing. You know, I love to build. I love to pick out doorknobs and colors and pick out splash walls and counters and color toilets and, you know, nice sinks and brush nickel fixtures. Like, like I just love to do that. I'm in my world and I'm able to do that and I do it cost effectively. See, I do it cost effectively and that's what that accounting uh, classes and stuff done for me. I'm able to manage multi-million dollar budgets and everything is appropriated correctly. So, you know, again, UCR, you want to build some affordable housing, use a community-based developer like Kim Carter from Time for Change Foundation so that we can supply all of your needs and you can keep the money in the community. You don't got to give it to Orange County to come out and build for you. We right here. <laughs> We right here. So anyway, back to the people, the kids at school, we're just trying to make sure that our kids are safe. You know, we don't know um, what's going to happen in the city of San Bernardino, particularly uh, one thing for sure, if they people not prepared for testing, they're not prepared for getting those results, then they're not prepared. We don't want to send our kids out there in the harm's way. We don't want to put our women in the harm's way. So whatever we can to, to, to do to support homeschooling, 
support having people uh, do virtual with our kids and, you know, have our staff be able to give kids uh, different activities in our big backyard. We're looking to do that. We do not want to infect the house. We do not want to infect our children. Thank you. Um, all right, so you an answered that question. Uh, Willie Ling has another question. Why do you think these evils continue to proliferate with all the black attorneys, social workers, counselors, and judges in the field? What do you think it will take to change our investment in the status quo? I think we need to, like, like I said before, you we need to get you guys elected into the system because see, we we elect those judges, we elect those DAs, we elect those sheriffs. So again, we need to get our people in position. Then we can start really dismantling the system and making the changes that need to be made. As long as they continue to hold the purse strings, then there goes the power right there. So, you know, it's like it's like saying to a, a judge, well, you know, you're, you're disproportionately sentencing people of color to, to prison. And the judge is like, but I'm doing what my colleagues do. I'm fitting in because I don't want to be seen as the judge that's going against the grain because I don't want to lose my job because I went to school and got all this school loan debt and I need to make sure I pay it off because I want a house for me and my kids with a pool in the back. So they're balancing all that. They're balancing that work, that life and that play. So how do I go into this courtroom and actually administer justice because I know there's injustice, but I'm given the tools from the oppressor and told take these oppressive tools and, and don't hit them so hard. But the oppressive tools is gonna to hit you regardless. So, you know, I don't think that it's about how we can get the judges to change more than we can just change the judges, more than we can keep making sure we put people in position to be able to um, dismantle this system. You know, it's, it, everything started with the police. The police is the first man on deck. So, you know, defund the police for sure. Black lives do matter. Let's make sure that we taking that money and putting that money into the communities to provide safety because we keep us safe. We keep we keep us safe. The police don't keep us safe. They respond after the fact. They're, they, they're not doing prevention and intervention. They're doing suppression, 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 suppression. We don't need no more suppression. We're suppressed out. We're suppressed, no matter, we're suppressed out. We need some intervention and prevention. And that comes with in the form of liquid capital, invest in our communities. We need resources. Like for example, I got almost 19 years that I have been doing this work and I have really illustrated some great programs with profound results and all that. You know what I'm saying? Can I get, you know, a $10 million grant? Can I get $10 million donation? Like, you know, like, like these hands can handle a large sums of money. So like if there is another level of uh, a racism that says, well, black led organizations, you're going to give a little bit money at a time. I'm saying, no, you can give us more because guess what? We have education in the county. We can account for every dollar. We're going to get our audits. It's going to be no problem. But allow us to be able to project and look forward and to be able to look down the road three to five and seven years. So we don't want to be living hand to mouth. Just because we are charity, we don't want to be poor. Then we did, then we like our clients. How I'm gonna eat, how my client gonna eat. I like, like we got, we can't, we can't operate like that. So, you know, for philanthropy, if you're listening out there, hi, this is Kim Carter from Time for Change Foundation. And you know, if you make an investment into Time for Change Foundation, you're changing lives. You're changing lives for children. You're changing lives for women. At our shelter program, the children have their own case manager. They're getting their own services to ensure that they can thrive. And women are being addressed with any issue they have. And everybody's working for prosperity, to thrive in communities. We do not recycle homelessness. We end it. All right, thank you. So we're gonna go ahead and um, extend the program by like 15 more minutes so we can get all your questions asked, but we are going to prioritize folks who haven't had the chance to um, ask Ms. Carter um, a question. So um, an attendee asked, thank you, Ms. Kim, for the amazing presentation. As you mentioned, the system is broken and it benefits those in power. How can we as individuals try to break free and do things at our level to bring about tangible change so that our, our next generation can live a life where all are treated fairly? 
I say we need to, first of all, we need to wake up. We need to walk around here really conscious. We need to work so that we're getting together and taking our ideas. I want to create this center in San Bernardino. And, you know, I vision it. So it's probably pretty much going to be happening here pretty soon. But, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a profitability center. Where can you go with your idea and, you know, and pitch your, your entrepreneurship idea and actually get an investment? Where can you go and get nurtured with your small business so that you can be able to become an employer and hire other people? Where can you go and get access to resources, loans and investments to be able to start your business, to be able to do the branding and the marketing, to be able to take your show and scale it and scale it into multiple locations. And so we need that and we need that in our area and we need it for everyday folks. You know, we don't need it just for people who can access an institution like you. We need it for people who are right now working at Amazon, but they still got ideas. They, they can look at Amazon and tell Amazon what they, they need to be doing. You see what I'm saying? Because anytime you're working in a job, you best know how to do it better than the boss. That's what they always say. <laughs> so I, I, I would say that. I would say let's get together. You know, I would say definitely start waking your kids up. You know, let, let wake, wake, wake them up. Wake these kids up. Wake these kids up. All right. So our next question is. Hey, uh, Nicole. My, my friend Nicole Barron is on here. Y'all, I'm going to tell you something. Nicole is a skier. She skis like the Amazons. If you ever get on her Facebook, Nicole Barron, her Facebook page, you can live vicariously through her jumps. Like, like she's in mid-ear with her skis. She's looking like she's professional. I think she's looking right. She is professional. But I've just seen her on there. I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, hey, Nicole. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, so our next question is, uh, well, they're saying, thank you for speaking to the depths of systematic racism that exists within institutions. Um, thinking about the Black or Bourgeois, um, can you speak to the experiences of Black elite who are through adjusting their Blackness, code switching, and assimilation play a key role in suppressing Black progressive progress, um, Black rebuilding of communities, and um, Black unity? So the thing about it is, and this is one of these things called a survival mode, right? So I want to take you back to, you know, just a picture in your mind, you know, about slavery and how people had to code switch in order to survive that. You know, they had people they had, they call it the field, the field hand, and they had the house hand, right? And so the person in the field was seen as the person who did the harshest work and got the worst treatment because they actually lived outside like other animals. And then you had that house hand and that house hand was inside and, you know, had to smell a little better and, and you know, had on proper clothes because they, they were so close to the slave owner that they had to at least smell right. But they had other duties to do as well, like, you know, have their, um, be, be able to warm bodies, warm the bodies of the slave owner. But at the end of the day, and they might have ate a little bit better because they, they scraped the plates or whatever, but at the end of the day, they were still oppressed. And so when you're that person that's in the midst of oppression and you're getting some relief, some type of relief where you can say to yourself, you know, I feel a little bit better because I was able to bathe with soap versus so-and-so who didn't have no soap, right? You're going to make yourself feel a little better. If you say, you know what, at least I was able to, you know, get my hair combed versus so-and-so who can't get their hair combed. And so those Black elite who um, you feel are suppressing or trying to hold down other Black people, that's just their mental health escape system to be able to feel good about themselves because at the end of the day, they're getting something a little bit better than what the masses is getting. But when it's all said and done, when they're driving around that nice car and the police pull up, they still a black man. They still a, they still a black. Hey, matter of fact, why are you riding around this nice car in this nice neighborhood? Pull out your ID. You know, so, 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 so sometimes they're constantly reminded that no matter how far up the chain you think you got, it's all of us or none. All of us or none. If all of us don't realize freedom, if all of us aren't free from oppression and suppression, then none of us are because you'll have your turn. And then you'll have those lovely children that went and got that great education and then they'll have their turn too. So at some point, right, we have to make sure that we are eradicating these systems and dismantling them. It's not just about escaping them. That's what I would say about our, our elite, our elitists. And, and so it, 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 even the word elite, I, I didn't even say the elite. You know, it's two kind of people. You either have have or you have not. So I'll say some of those haves. 
Okay, our next question is, well, they, they quoted you, they'd rather nothing be built on a piece of dirt than for me to build affordable housing. Um, the person says, yes, we would love to know if you are exploring black or POC led community land trust options in the IE. So the thing is, I have looked into community land trust. This was years ago. This was years ago. And so it's like anything else. The community is, is circling around the wagon, building up the power in order to claim and stake hold of land, right? So you got to know that the community land trusts are fighting against the oppressive system for, for land. And so if there is a community land trust out there that's listening right now and you have land that you're willing to not oppress me with, but allow me access to so that I can build affordable housing, please call me 951-217-0971. That is my phone number, 951-217-0971. Call me. Call me, call me community land trust so that we can go ahead and get that from being land and turn it into housing. Because at this point with the rate of um, disparity and assurance that we have, there should be no land, no community land trust that's not developed because people live under the bridge right now. So what are we waiting on? Thank you. Our next question is, thank you, Ms. Carter. How can we change the system in which we have to ask and protest for legislation that legitimizes the freedom in the white masses' eyes that we already know we have. I will go back to the original point again, right? You are the change that you are looking for. Be the change that you want to see. We need people in office, running for office, so we can get you in office, so you can go on in, you can make that legislation that you need to happen. In the meantime, you got to find these progressive leg legislators who will willing to do the work of the community. I will say there are some there, you know, especially in the Inland Empire. You got El Eloise Reyes, you got her there, you got um, uh, Connie that is there that, that have carried progressive bills and took it all the way to the finish line. They had no starters and didn't turn around to be quitters. So you do have some there. But I would say that, you know, that's what we have to do. We have to build the leadership that we're looking for. We have to make sure that's going to be there to represent us in the Capitol. So many times we send folks to Washington and we send them to Sacramento and then we quit following them. No, now's when you got to hold them accountable. They said, they said anything to get elected. Now we got to see what they're going to do once they get up in there. Now we got to hold them accountable for that. So I'll say that that's one of the things, you know, and, and we make laws. So at, at Top Tape Foundation, we went from breaking laws to making laws. So we make laws. So we have ideas for laws. We have Sarita Regis, our policy advocate. We are making laws. We're in Sacramento. We're working some bills right now that we're pushing to get passed. So, you know, you have the ability to have that to spark the idea that's going to have the next law to be changed, this law to be made and then changed. So please bring that to fruition. All right. Um, Mark says, uh, with dis distance learning taking place now, do you have any recommendation or ideas on how we can reach those students who need help or help them build resiliency? So here's what I would say. So that distance, like, like me personally, I took one class that was just learning and I will never do it again because I don't learn like that. My learning style is I need to, I need to get, I need to ask some questions. I need engagement. It didn't work for me, right? It did not, it did not work for me. So if I judge the world based on myself, I would kind of figure out how that we can get these uh, students, you know, in an environment, social distancing or whatever, where they can, you know, access people and real, get real time questions. I would think that we need those, we need, we, we need, okay, here's the thing. So, you know, they got those drive-ins, those big old screens in the drive-in, right? We need to be able to take our people to the drive-in. You see what I'm saying? Let them all get out, sit on top of the car, top of the hard hoods. You see what I'm saying? And let's, let's look at that big screen. Let's look at each other. Like, like we need, <laughs> we are village people. We need to come together in some kind of way to come together without being together, right? We got to really figure that out. And so I, I just feel like our kids need to experience and learning and just watching the screen all day long. It's just not going to cut it for a lot of kids. You know, access to the internet is not free. Now I'm here in the Bay Area right now. I can go anywhere and I can pretty much jump online somewhere because 
they have a lot of free Wi-Fi around here. But in San Bernardino, uh, Wi-Fi is not like that. It, you know, you can't you just can't be jumping on it anywhere you go. You might can go to a Starbucks, but you have to be at a place. It's just not like I just sitting out there waiting on you to jump on it. So apparently up here, they don't care if people get on the Wi-Fi. It's like, get on it. Do what you got to do. But when it's so controlled and oppressed conditions in the neighborhood, they're restricting your information and access to it. So a lot of kids can't even get Wi-Fi. So, so they got these Chromebooks they got sent home with that they had to learn how to use because they wasn't using them in school already. Now they don't even got the Wi-Fi. So, you know, it's a lot of barriers to that. And so, you know, I would say try to figure out ways that we can get our kids um, to facilities or to something spread out. Hey, may, maybe take those those football fields that nobody's playing football on, you know, and get some jumbotrons going in, in four different corners and let the kids, you know, have some headphones and and watch and watch the screen and see other kids, you know, in another couple of feet away or something. Like that. Get creative with this. Get creative. We got to get creative. Okay, and I think this is going to be our last question. I think it's it's perfect. Um, does Time for Change have foundation offer opportunities um, for students and young people to get involved, like internships, fellowships, and collaborations with universities? Yes. So Vanessa Perez is our executive director, and she's young just like you guys, and she loves to work with uh, students. She loves people who come in and do internships. Like we on COVID relief right now, so you know everything has changed. But you know, if you guys have like a project to do or you need to do an analysis project or a research project, you know, let, let's just say for example, if you want to go look at San Bernardino County's Board of Supervisors agenda over, let's say, the last three years and see how much money was uh, delved down to white-led institutions versus people of color institutions. And then people of color institutions, what person of color was it? Was it, was it African-American? Was it Hispanic? Was it Asian? Was it other? And just see how much of our overall county dollars are being spent, you know, for, for being spent on the community or spent with people who are of, of diversity and then take a look at it. Is majority of it being spent in Orange County or LA County or, you know, in what county? Because I would I would dare to say the majority of it not being spent in San Bernardino County. So, you know, and then and that, and do analysis of that. And then we can take a look and have some trends and stuff. And then we can do a report, you know, and call it, you know what I'm saying, when uh, the disparity of the county is uh, disparitizing itself because if you're not spending money in your own county, why are you bragging about being a county? You don't even trust yourself right now. You ain't spending money with yourself. I'm just saying, you know, we can name it something like that, but I mean, that would be a project that I would love to see happen because, because I just know that that's what they're doing. <laughs> I just know. I just know. I just know, you know, and we need to get a control of those resources. All right. Well, Thank you, Ms. Carter. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for questions. This concludes our webinar for today. I'd like to once again thank Ms. Kim Carter for taking the time to join us today for this timely talk about important issues um, facing our community. And thank you all for attending um, and supporting our webinar series. You can learn more about the UCR School of Public Policy seminar series at SPP ucr.edu. Our next webinar will be on August 28th with the founder of the Voice Media Ventures, Paulette Brown Hines, who will talk about the importance of the Black press in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so please join us for that. Till next time, goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye, you guys. Thank you.